Hey guys, welcome to today's show. Today I'm in conversation with a lovely human being called Sarah Wilson. Sarah is Australian, lives in Sydney, and is a New York Times best-selling author. We chatted together about her books, about her take on anxiety. She has huge wisdom and insight about all of that, about how to write books, her process as an author, her creative process. Some of you budding authors will find that really helpful. We talked about relationships. I know that Sarah is single in her late 40s and so much of my audience are women. And I wanted to ask her about relationships and does she get lonely? And where and how does she find love and connection if it's not in relationship with another person? And she was really open and vulnerable about that. And I really appreciated that. So you are going to love this chat together. Enjoy. Please don't forget to leave a comment or a review. If you don't subscribe, hit subscribe right now and uh, stick with us. All right. Thanks again for being here. Enjoy. Hey, let me start by asking you, Sarah, how has COVID been for you? How have you found COVID and the lockdown, the isolation and so on? I think people would be interested to know how you handle that. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, because there's a bit of a paradox that goes on. As you know, right. Paul, I have quite intense anxiety. And so, um, and I live on my own. Um, and we had a very intense lockdown almost this time last year, which was quite effective in ensuring that today we have very little COVID here in Australia. But right. I, I, I actually found that my anxiety abated in part because I actually feel, and this is what I've found with a lot of anxious people, um, it was like the circumstances finally matched our sense of intrinsic anxiety and our sense that life is not right and that we're off track and that we probably need to be living life differently. So mm. all of a sudden I felt that, okay, this is my moment, you know, I fit, I fit into life. Um, and I've got obsessive compulsive disorder and and bipolar and what that means is I'm highly sensitive and attuned to sounds danger a crisis um fortunately I was writing my book as well as you know it was due at the right. printers days before COVID struck I pulled it back from my publishers and just said look I think we need to sit on this and observe what's happening and I sat on it for six weeks and then a couple of weeks longer um, Black Lives Matters happened and so so much was happening and my friends actually said to me, can you get that book to the printers because Martians will land next, like, you know. Yeah, right, right, I'll, yeah. I'll book. So I guess I had a sense of purpose. So I was in lockdown on my own, but I was able to focus on, on work that I found very important and rewarding and relevant. But the anxiety piece is interesting. I mean, Greta Thunberg, she has said this in relation to her mental um, disorders or mental health. She was self-harming, unable to speak for a year, et cetera, when she was in her teens before she went and sat outside the Swedish parliament. And a lot of people were like, well, somebody with, you know, Asperger's, et cetera, you know, self-harming issues, et cetera, shouldn't be out there protesting. And her point was when I started to take action about what was really making me anxious, mm. then I just started to feel like I was truly living my life. And that's how I've felt. I have used this time to motivate myself into even further climate action, racial um, action, et cetera, et cetera. So do you think there are various kinds of anxiety? You have a particular kind and brand that means that the lockdown had hidden benefits to you, but that is not necessarily true across the board for people that struggle with anxiety. What is it about your type, if I can use that word, that makes the lockdown, the pandemic, have hidden serendipitous gifts, I suppose, to you? Well, I suppose there's this hypervigilance that comes with some of the disorders. So um, this is getting a little bit granular, but OCD and bipolar exist in roughly 1.2 to 1.4% of all populations around the world, and they believe oh. throughout history. So they've traced it back and looked at the behaviours of shaman and community leaders, etc. during a crisis. And what they've found is they've generally displayed behaviours like OCD or bipolar. And what some evolutionary theorists are saying is that these sort of evolutionary quirks, those of us who fit into that very narrow slither of humanity, we have these quirks because we, we need 1.2% of the population to have acute 
sense of danger, alertness, sense of smell. Um, anyone listening who's got these conditions will know that we can smell everything. We can literally smell danger. Uh, we can hear everything. We are thinking about everything. Um, we are five steps ahead in terms of working out a, an escape route, you know. And Diane Fosey, who was an incredible biologist um, in the 1960s and 70s, she went and removed a bunch of chimps from a clan who possessed these sort of behavioural behaviours, like um, OCD-type behaviours. And, again, it was about 1.2% of the clan. She removed them. The clan died out in less than six months, either oh. being eaten by tigers, not able to determine what food was safe, etc. So oh. I think when you've got extreme anxiety, we exist for a purpose. And if you think back to wartime leaders, even in recent history, Winston Churchill was, was bipolar. They say that 70% of crisis leaders were, were bipolar. And the same with poets and scientists. They generally have an, anx a, a, an anxious disorder. So I think the difference is, is that it's almost like um, these qualities that in peaceful times we feel like freaks. And, of course, the worst thing about anxiety is you get anxious about being anxious. Then you get anxious about being anxious about being anxious. Now, if you are an everyday person, you can generally function and you're part of the um, 98 point, you know, 6% of the population, then you come across a crisis and anxiety is a really real response. Right. And so um, when we are, for instance, hungry, we go and seek out food. When we're thirsty, we seek out water. When we're in a crisis, we seek out other humans. We need to congregate. And that's for the bulk of the population. And, and a lot of us have been denied that, right? So that's a very real biological cause of anxiety. It makes us all want to go and find more people, but we're prevented from it if we're in lockdown. Um, so those of us who don't have the extreme anxiety, it's, a, it's new. It's a new situation and you have to be on alert and you're not used to being on alert like, mm -hmm. say, I am. And so it's, uh, it's, it's frightening because it does trigger a flight or fight response. In us. That's what anxiety does. It's there to tell us danger, danger, fight or flee, or in some cases, freeze. Sometimes that is a mechanism that's required. So that's sort of my assessment of things, but everybody is different. Everybody's going through all different types of anxiety. I think a lot of people are very nervous of going back to normal now. The idea of having to go out and uh, be public again, to dress, I'm like we're dressing today, Paul, you know, in sort of casual gear and, and to front up to meetings and to be accountable. And this is something I write about in my book is that our culture, and it's been accentuated by COVID, but our culture has sort of retreated for, from in real life interactions. We've cocooned ourselves from discomfort to the extent where we've just cocooned ourselves from having to interact up front to confront. And real life and other humans are hard, right? Mm -hmm. The point, though, we rise and we build resilience and strength and we've lost so much of that. So we're very ill-equipped at the moment to be able to deal with the transitions and the changes that are happening. And I think that we all need to understand that, that our culture and technology has, has enabled us to to avoid discomfort for, I would say, two to three decades, uh, particularly in the last 10 years. I think it's something like 90% of technology in the last 30 years um, has been created to make, to get rid of discomforts, yeah. to speed things up, to prevent us from having to wait for anything. Um, you know, we don't have to even wonder where our pizza is, our takeaway pizza is, because we're right. on our app see exactly how long it's going to be, right? right. Um, and we can avoid, for instance, going on a date. All these people yep. at the moment during COVID are doing these sort of, you know, virtual dates and flirting and are frankly terrified of actually having to turn up and have a drink with someone sometime soon. So wow. these are all real and I, we've got to have compassion, compassion for ourselves as to why this is happening. But my point is we need to jerk out of that fear and stuckness to be able to move forward because what lies ahead, I hate to say it, is more terrifying. The mm -hmm. climate crisis is being, is being dialed up. We are gonna have probably more pandemics. This is not the end of, of pandemic season. For, right. for, for, 
So the sooner we start to build resilience, and it's a muscle, as you know, I'm sure you've spoken to many guests who've talked mm. about this. Resilience is a muscle, and we used to have traditions, right? We used to have traditions like initiation ceremonies and sending kids out into the desert. In our country, the Indigenous people did that. Right. So they would face themselves in the desert and come back as men, you know. We have lost that resilience training. In fact, parenting today is all about putting them into a big mushroom-like cloud and protecting right. them from right. everything except for real life because real life yeah. is hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think... I think what I've noticed in the pandemic with the people I've been speaking to and what I've been speaking and doing coaching and mentoring, a lot of people have moved towards stability thinking it's resilience. So it's battening down the hatches to weather the storm rather than getting better because of the storm, which I think is more resilience. And I think so many individuals and organizations and businesses that thought they could weather the storm by trying to stabilize and batten down the hatches have not and have not used it to become resilient in the way you're describing. So I love the way you have framed that. I think it's hugely important, as you say, for what's coming next. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we also talk about the vaccine. Once the vac everyone's been vaccinated, right. everything's going to be fine. So right. everyone's sort of on the pause button. If we can just sustain things until, I don't know, people talk about October, they're talking about April next year. And as we know already, those timelines are being pushed out further and further as we get new strains, etc. So I think, yes, I totally agree with you. We need to be turning our attention to that resilience piece rather than sort of form fitting into a slightly new shape, you know, and, and then trying to make that shape as close to what it used to be as possible. Um, I want to, I'm I want, absolutely I want to, excited by it. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, I noticed in your book you spoke about, um, you didn't use the word pandemic, or maybe you did, of loneliness in the world. Do you think we're going to come out of this with that exacerbated even more than it's ever been? And what does that, what are the prospects of that in the, in the coming years? This massive increasing suicide rate, all the isolations done to people and so on and so on, those that didn't think they had any kind of anxiety, depression, demons have, of course, bumped into that. Now a lot of house of cards have collapsed personally and corporately and so on. What do you think the outcome of that's going to be with this whole loneliness thing? I loved how you framed that in your new book. Yes. Yeah, so as you know, I sort of don't refer to loneliness. Well, I actually piece it apart. I point out that we're not actually lonely for more social interactions in fact right. we've been stopped by interactions it's not like we're all sitting around twiddling our thumbs with no yeah. phone calls, no texts etc it's i mean of course some people are and and that's a very real issue but really what it is that we're lonely for is meaningful connection now mm. i think covid is just a big revealer covid ripped the band-aid right. off the, the you know right. the elastic off the, off the wound, and we're now being seeing what was always there. And I think that's something that we need to, to realise, that what we're actually lonely for is meaningful connection. And so what I mean by that is we're lonely for meaningful connection with others, meaningful connection with ourselves, and also meaningful connection with what I call almost the matrix of life, you know, values, uh, nature, the, the, our bigger belonging in the world. And we've yeah, lost yeah. on that. And I think that if we can actually steer our attention to addressing that side of things, um, the meaningfulness piece, then if you think about it, suicide. In, in America, the life expectancy has dropped three years in a row for the first time in history due to what they're calling diseases of despair, which is opioid wow. use, alcohol and primarily suicide, youth suicide. Now, a lot of it stems from the fact that people are feeling that like they don't have, it's not because they're all lonely, primarily, I think it's primarily that there's a sense of meaninglessness. There's, we don't have a discussion around values, around morals, around ethics, around community spirit. We used to, but what I call the moral, moral umpires that were on the football field of life, you know, ensuring that our individualism didn't take over and we just became a whole heap of, um, you know, Lord of the Flies kind of rampant right. egocentric cannibals, um, were these moral umpires and they took the form of maybe a community priest, 
um, a spiritual guide. They were perhaps community leaders. They were scout leaders. Um, they were, the, the, and even human rights, um, or sorry, human resources departments that would ensure we didn't work past six o'clock each day, you know? We had all these kind of people that put up moral guardrails for us. They've been obliterated from the field, right. from the footy field of life, right? And right. primarily by neoliberalism, this idea that we don't want intervention. We could just all be these individual units doing our economic thing and everything will take care of ourselves. Well, you know what? Pandemic hits and guess what we need? Government intervention and we need right. moral guidance and we need spiritual leaders and we need people to tell us what's going on, you know? So that is what I think we need to focus on. And there's a great quote, very ironically, from Milton Friedman, the founder of neoliberalism and sort of contemporary capitalism. But it's a beautiful quote, and I love it more so for the irony that he said it. He said, a crisis produces real change but it will depend on the ideas that are lying around at the time. Right, so right. I ask everybody, what ideas do you want lying around as we move forward um, into the future? And that's the opportunity we have right now. A few years ago, our government appointed a minister of suicide. We never heard of such a thing in our government as a ministerial office. Um, I think it flagged up for the first time to many people in our country how bad it must be to justify a ministerial position and department in government. And of course, this was only in response to um, statistics of those that actually succeeded in committing suicide. Of course, there are many more that never show up in a, you know, an ER department, so you never know how many that is beneath the surface. And I think that it's flagged up for us here in the UK just how drastic it is. This is before COVID now. So God knows what the outcome will be, you know, a couple of years on from where we are now. I love the quote um, by Archbishop Desmond Tutu in the early 60s. He just talked about the beginnings of apartheid. And he said, you can only rescue so many drowning people from the river without going upstream to find out who's pushing them in, i.e., that the state was complicit in the drowning, you know, the, the people drowning in poverty and starvation and protest and crime and addictions were pushed into those behaviors by no option the state gave them. And I kind of feel that those chickens are coming home to roost too in all of our countries, that the government that's appointed the Minister of Suicide is clearly also complicit in a lot of things that are causing people's isolation, loneliness, division, separation, and so on, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. I think, well, and then the governments are uh, part of a system. And, and right. as you know, in the book, I identify quite boldly that I think it's capitalism. And capitalism is an yes. inert system. It's not like we can get angry at it. Um, it's, a, it's a system that we bought into. And I actually make the parallel, as you know, between capitalism and the cult. And if you go by the official definition of what a cult is, it ticks off every criteria. Um, right. I mean, we pay our dues, we go into debt to pay homage to this idea that more, more, more is going to make us happy. Um, you know, there's a whole range of things we do. We, 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 we sacrifice. We sacrifice our well-being. We sacrifice love. We sacrifice family and friends to, to sort of kneel at the altar of earning money for what? You know, um, and we and we don't believe that there's any alternative. So once you're in a cult, you can't believe that there's right. any other alternative. And so look at when I bring up the idea of capitalism as being a problem, people go, oh, well, you must be a communist. Um, right. You know, it's like anything else is going to be an enemy, which is very cult-like, sure. right? When you just can't even fathom that, hmm, maybe there's something in between, you know. Right. Um, so I, I feel that that's something that can actually be quite empowering because really there's no capitalist leader out there. There's nobody that's going to come and shoot us if we stop spending, right? Yeah. So yeah. we actually can take stock of this and we can start to simply not buy into the message that more, more, more matters to us. And I think COVID actually, while it's been um, very difficult for so many people, I also think people are quite relieved to have had a whole heap of redundancies exposed to them. You know, mm -hmm. people have got their expensive black SUV parked in their driveway. 
doing nothing. And they suddenly go, what on earth have I got that car for? Or whatever it might be, the expensive handbags, the expensive shoes. Yeah. And all of a sudden we've got actually quite simple and gentle. And we've realised, you know, um, that what matters to us is actually much closer and accessible than we ever thought. And as you know, my big thing in the book, a very accessible way, a very accessible salve to the, the big cluster of issues going on, because where do you start naming, naming the, the issue? It's climate crisis, COVID, it's the political fragmentation, it's the us versus them, it's the conspiracy theories, it's the racial inequality. I mean, it's just everything. And it really is all the same thing. We are disconnected from a meaningful existence. We have been drawn away from, a moral, from the moral fabric of humanity. And I argue that going back to nature where we see ourselves reflected back in the patterns, right. in abilities, the beautiful ebb and flow and, um, and sort of safety of nature. You know, if we can go back into nature, we can start to see that it all sort of makes sense. And nature's my greatest teacher, but I also go through a bunch of studies, as you know, that show why nature does this to our brains by just stepping into it. And it can be a park. You know, yeah, no, I loved, I loved even the way that you analyze the nuance of the rhythm of walking to the body. Who yes. knew? I'm like, who the hell knows this stuff? It's, it's so true. Once I had language for it, it made such sense, actually. And, and I think I was going to say to you, I want to ask you about your work a little bit, because I'm going to say to you, um, of course, I'm a great reader like you are. Um, I don't get through lots of books, but yours was such an easy read because you, I think, make complex things simple, which is itself not easy to do. And I was going to ask you about how you got into writing. I know you had previous um, experience and roles in publishing, editing, magazines and journalism. Was that the foundation? Because you can't just, or do you just switch one day to become an author? I'm going to write a book, which, you know, we all know is really tough to do for most people. So how did you move into that? author and writing these books yeah um well I've always written and I've always had to express myself and to this day I comfort myself it's one of my anxiety techniques is to write to myself and and it's it's unreadable even to me because I write in journalistic shorthand and and so on um, but I suppose, I don't know, I can't say it was a pretty transition. Um, first, we make The Big Beautiful, which is about my anxiety, where I reframe mm. anxiety through a philosophical and spiritual lens rather than just slamming it with a medical diagnosis. I, um, that, I started that and I got 60,000 words in many years, you know, quite some time ago. It was 10 years ago. And I hated it, didn't gel, I wasn't ready. And I threw the entire lot out didn't keep even my notes. And I came back to it a number of years later and um, started writing it. And I suppose I was more ready for it. I felt that I had something I could share. Um, I'd already so written a bunch of cookbooks, the I Quit Sugar cookbooks in between. So I understood the publishing realm. And also I'd been blogging. This is probably the best advice I can give. I'd been blogging about these subjects. And what I do as a writer is I test my audience. I put ideas out there, see what yeah, comes yeah. up, what the questions are and where the pain point is. And then I write a little bit more and I get sort of feedback. And some of that blog content can often feed into my book, you know. I copy and paste some of my blogs and rewrite around it and it becomes a bigger topic. But um, I guess I get my confidence from having tested it with my audience on social media over quite a long period, like a couple of years before I write the book, but it's torturous. I mean, first we make the beast beautiful. Really, took seven years. I mean, yeah, when I you said you didn't, when you said you didn't feel you were ready, what do you mean by you didn't feel you were ready? And how did you know when you were ready? What does that mean for you? Well, I wasn't ready because I was still swimming around in all of the ideas. Like, it's like the okay. balls had landed. I was, mm. I was in a lot of pain when I wrote it. I was very sick. It was in my mid thirties, and mm. I and close to um, heart failure from a very bad autoimmune disease. And mm. I, I'd left my, po you know, my post as editor of Cosmo and I'd not worked for a year. I could barely walk. So I was in a bad way, you know, wow. and I was forcing myself to have the energy to write it. 
I also think that it's just I needed a few more years on the planet. I needed more wisdom. I needed to be able to stand back. And as you know, I don't write in a didactic way. I don't write as somebody on the pulpit speaking down to people, which right. is how a lot of help stuff goes, right? Right, I, right. It's a journey. So both books, I go on a journey with the reader. They're with me as I go and interview the His Holiness the Dalai Lama, you know, as I go hiking in Jordan with a shepherd, you know, people are with me along the way and I explore it like a conversation. And that voice in itself didn't develop until probably through writing the cookbooks, the I Quit Sugar Movement. Oh. I always, that probably really trained my thinking to never tell anyone what to do. It was mm-hmm. always I quit sugar, not you must quit sugar. It's like I quit sugar, I went and read because I've got this, you know, incredibly painful and inconvenient bipolar brain and I can go and absorb vast amounts of science and interview endocrinologists and experts around the world and then I'm able to condense it just from my years of working as a newspaper journalist and editor of a women's magazine into information that feels accessible. So, um yeah, I suppose that was it. And then once you've written one, you sort of have a little bit more confidence. But every step of the way, I hate what I'm writing. I doubt myself the whole way. And I do that with my life in general. But mm. she years on the planet has enabled me to go, well, sometimes the more anxious I am, the better the result. There seems to be a connection there. And that's why in my books I refer to anxiety as my superpower. Because it's my anxiety that steers me away from a really bad paragraph. You know, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and go, that idea was terrible. Take it out, Sarah. You know? So I do try one to mo- use anxiety. In that one way. of the most famous authors in England, one of the first of his kind to make a living from writing, there's a guy called Somerset Maugham. And he was asked in an interview with the newspaper once, did he write when inspiration struck him or only to a schedule? And he said, I only write when inspiration strikes me. Fortunately, it strikes me at nine o'clock every morning. Meaning he put himself into a space to be inspired. And I wonder what is your creative process for people listening to this that do. And I think think what's going to happen out of COVID, I've picked this up quite a bit amongst young people, that they've decided to aspire to a different vocation to the one they they were on track with before it all got Mm -hmm. wrecked. I wonder if a lot of these young people are going to come through to want to have a voice like yours, to want to write, to blog, to post and do it well, but are terrified at the process or their initial attempts have been so terrible, they don't believe yours have or mine have. And so they quit at the beginning. And I think it's good for them to hear what you just said, that it's awful, it's terrible, it's a struggle because he just simply went every day to his little shed um, like Raul Dahl and just sat there until something good came, some days it didn't, some days it did. And I wonder what your process is. Stephen Pressfield in his writing about creativity speaks about um, combat boots versus slippers, that a lot of people's creative process is slippers. They wait till the inspiration strikes and rarely produce anything. Others put their boots on every day and go and write, whether they're inspired or not. Is that more like what you do? It is. I'm not as disciplined as some of those writers, but I think you'll find it's a really good point, Paul. I think that most writers throughout history will say they just sit down and they wow. do the work and sometimes wow. the work amounts to one sentence. <laughs> right. Bad sentence, right? Right, So right. I, I accept it's slog. I accept it is, like, if you want a cruisy job, don't become a writer. There you go. That's right. what I say up front. But I find right. that in- I find that encouraging and um, and sort of comforting because, you know, I say to myself, I can do hard slog. It's only hard work, right? If I know that that's right. what it's going to take. So, yes, I get up. I, I, you have to be disciplined. It's non-negotiable. And, it's, right. you know, if I have my morning routine, I do all of that, then I sit down and I write. And to be honest, my routine for writing changes all the time. Oh. You know, I need to mix it up. I'm somebody who can't even walk to the post office um, the same way oh. each time. I've got to mix really? things up. That's just who I am. But part of my thing is to accept the chaos that I tend to work to. I need to shift things all the time, you know. I need to move my computer screen along a foot 
you know, okay. just to yeah, yeah. different lights from the window. And I do things like that. Not everyone's like that. But the point is I am there doing the work every day. Um, equally, I also allow a little bit of chaos. Sorry, that's almost my modus operandi. But I will still do the work. Like if I've done some work and I'm still feeling quite good, I will go to a cafe or just, there's a little bookshop that has that serves wine. And I would often go and sit at five o'clock in the evening and have a glass of wine and continue to write. And I quite I write about it actually in some wild and precious life. The discordance of it felt great. Where kids are coming home from school and parents are cooking dinner or they're going out on a date and I don't have any of those things in my life. I have my writing and my work. And so it felt kind of really, it sort of, it got me into this sort of broader, expansive mindset by going into a situation where I'm not meant to be. You're not, a single woman in her late 40s is not meant to be sitting in a bookshop cafe having a glass of wine, writing a book about the end of the world in this day and age. So I go and do it. So I do like to throw a little bit of chaos into things and it makes things expansive. Um, so, yeah, I do subscribe to that idea. It's hard work. And I think it was um, F. Scott Fitzgerald said, anything any good takes a long time. And I remind myself of Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah, that beautiful song that we all think was effortless. That took him seven years to write, I think, wow. five or seven years. Um, Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen took nine months of solid, solid fiddling and writing and all of that kind of thing. So some things take a long time. They just do. But I'll I've, heard some, I've heard some authors say that they write um, almost assuming no one will read it. It was they write it for themselves. They don't write thinking it's going to be a bestseller or people are waiting to hear from you with this book. I suppose you get to a point where as an author, you have that captive audience like a band do. Um, you're all waiting for Ed Sheeran's next album or Coldplay's, that you get to that level of momentum. But do you write, I mean, when you're writing, do you think this is great, this is authentic, this is my essence that I'm putting on this paper and that's as good as I can do, whether it's popular or people buy it or not, is that a big motivation or not? Oh, it's all of it. Every single doubt, reassurance, everything, right once and I oscillate so I do a lot of self-coaching as I'm writing at the end of the day um I think I just go this for some reason this is what life has found me as a writer and this is what I do and if it fails oh well um I always know that there might be a couple hundred people that read it and if a couple hundred people get something out of it like my first book my first uh, recipe book and with the eight-week program in it um I quit sugar um my, I did it as a, it was very early days. I taught myself how to make it into an ebook. This was before it was a print book. And because everybody was saying, oh, we want all the information on the spot. And I, Twitter had just been invented. This is how long ago it was. And wow. I was tweeting really bad photos of the meals I was cooking. That was a very early food Instagrammer. Um, and uh, I, I, just put it together in this sort of ebook, and I thought, look, if I can help a hundred people, it'll pay for itself. Cool, right. interesting experiment. That, and so it, it, and it ended up becoming an Amazon bestseller in three weeks, and then it got printed as a print book and became a New York Times bestseller, and it's now in fifty-four countries. There you go. Um, but I, I wow. found that if I, um, my, my goals are generally that humble, and they still are to this day. When I say humble, I mean small. I actually just want to be able to help a few people. And mm. I, am, I let go of success and financial success in particular a long time ago. Yes, right. Yeah, so I, as I, gave, I gave all my money from my I quit sugar profits to charity and I continue to do so. And that enables me the freedom, funnily enough, to keep creating with no, I mean, people can't, I, I feel like I can't criticise myself and others can't criticise me um, because I have that, that freedom. Um, and I know myself after so many years of this that I will keep layering and layering until it is right. So I write it and then I do this jigsaw piece, you know, and I've got bits of paper I handwrite. That's the other thing. And you probably remember walking goes at the same pace as discerning thought, but so does handwriting. Mm. 
Mm. It's, it, it, it goes at the same pace as our ability to think good, rich thoughts. And so, whereas typing's too fast and frenetic. So I handwrite and then I have these bits of paper pinned up all over my room. And of course, I wrote part of the book Living on the Road out of a backpack. So I'd move to the next place, I'd pack up all the bits of paper and then unfurl it all on you know, the next Airbnb floor. And I did that for, you know, three years. But, um, yeah, I layer up. So it's a real process. I don't just sit down and have a stream of consciousness. I sort of write for a bit and then I have a moment of doubt and then I tweak it. And then, But there is nothing more beautiful, Paul, when you actually look at a sentence or a paragraph or a chapter or an idea and you go, I think I've nailed that. Right. And yeah. a beautiful emotional thing that happens. It's almost mm. like... You know, on a Mac computer, the socket kind of sort of sucks in. There's a magnet to it. Right, right. I feel connected to humanity. And when I've hit that spot, I go, okay, I actually think I can admit I'm happy with that, you know. Yes, Um, yes. And then I go through it. Yeah. And and I I can say it's that sitting down and being with it for hours on end and layering it and then a thought comes and it can only, sometimes only 5% little tweak and it makes it magic, makes something mm. really bland magic, but you've sat with it. You've sat with mm. the problem. You are single, right? Yes. How do you manage that? I was going to talk about relationships and, you know, 67, I think it is 68% of my social media followers are women. And I thought some of these out there, the single women that are at a similar age to you, that have a calling on vocation, like you share, like you have, um, do you get lonely? What is your philosophy about relationships and all of that? Yeah, well, there. I mean, gosh, how much time do we have here? I've been single <laughs> Sorry since. to throw that in. <laughs> oh, this late no, I, 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 I'm more than happy to talk about anything I've thought deeply about. There might be an idea in there that resonates for another person. Right. Um, I have been single essentially for 16 years. I'm now 47. Um, I find I've chosen to try and find love where I can find it, even if it's unconventional. So mm-hmm. I've traveled a lot. I meet beautiful humans around the world. I have relationships as I go, one night stands, if it turns out to be that. Um, and of course, we don't really talk about those kinds of things, right? Um, I, I do, and I stay friends with them, and they are beautiful people in my life. I have two men at the moment in Africa who are in dangerous jobs who I've never met before. One of them I've been in touch with for a year and a half. We tell each other we love each other. We speak regularly. When I'm having a bad moment, I call him. Um, as I say, we've never met. Um, I have beautiful humans, men and women around the world. I have children in my life. I foster Aboriginal children. It's very challenging for me, but I I seek out intimacy where I can. And that's the life I lead. And you know what I do to cope with it? I I have that chapter in my book called Soul Nerding. I go and nerd out. That is, I go and read the works of women like, of, of people who are like me. So I can go cool they had a great life unfortunately a few of them that I was about to cite um didn't have a long life because they killed themselves Virginia Woolf Sylvia Sylvia Plath and so on but I think is it Martha Goldsman who was married to Ernst Hemingway but then had a life you know wonderful life really as a single woman for many years as a war correspondent um so there's all life has changed Life has changed so much and so we can actually create our own meaning. And I find inspiration in Jane Fonda and what she's been saying. She's a massive climate activist and she makes the point that as you start to reach menopause and go through menopause and your hormones drop off, you know, oestrogen made us these big sort of bumbling caring machines, right, where we put all our energy into caring for other people. That's what we're programmed to do by our hormones. Right, sure. Estrogen starts to drop off and all of a sudden you're like, ah, I've got heaps of space and time. And Jane Fonda makes the point that it's a great opportunity for women who are postmenopausal to put that energy, because we've also got lots of energy. We're suddenly Mm -hmm. like, oh, I'm not caring about everything. I've got energy to put it into activism. And so the number of women in their 40s, 50s and 60s, we are a crew, a really high calibre crew of women who are sleeves rolled up, doing the good fight, 
you know, in the climate movement. So that's one thing I would say. I mean, I have more nourishment, more love, more care, more intimacy from, from that crew and that work that I do, and as well as the fostering than I used to have when I was in relationships. Wow. You know? Wow. Such a great response, such a great answer, Sarah. Thanks for that. I wanted to ask you um, about faith. Do you believe in God? Yes. My foster kid asked me that last night. Yeah, um, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? God is nature. God is the inevitability, the patternings of nature. Um, it's sort of the matrix in which we are in. And I don't know how far it expands, how many universes. I think it's infinity. Mm. I love the unknownness of it, but it's a power far greater than me. And I and I pray to it. I pray to it. I trust it. I love it. And um, I can't, I, it's, you know, I'm, I access it via all in mm. nature and mm. that's why going to nature is to be reminded of there is an intelligence. I suppose I would call it the intelligence of life and nature. Um, and I, 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 I'm humbled, I bow to it, and I, I love being such a small entity in it. I love that there's a bigness. And so when I contemplate the climate crisis and the fact that things are not looking good for humanity. You know, the planet will be fine. The matrix of life will be fine. It will recorrect. Uh, to do that, it might need to kick humans off the planet because we've kind of stuffed things up. Um, and that's just what life does. And I'd be disappointed if we got a leave pass, if we got a, a, a sort of a, an exception to the rule pass as humans because we think we're that special. I'd be really upset because I'm like, oh, my God, life right. hasn't got the perfect logic, the perfect truth I thought it did. Yeah, so yeah. I have faith in that. I have, you know, but do I think it's part of our nature to fight for what matters? I think that's one of the most beautiful things about humans. Yes, I do. And that's why I write the books I do, because I want everybody to have the opportunity to live as fully as they can, i.e., become fully human and fight for what we love. And what we love is life right. on the planet, not on Mars. So I just, it breaks my heart that people aren't getting that memo yet. Right, right. Do you think about, worry about, are afraid of dying? No, no. Um, I've had a past of, you know, suicide attempts. I've gone there. Mm. Mm. I've faced it. I've literally, there's a moment in First We Make the Beast Beautiful where I write about looking at myself in the mirror and I can't see myself. And uh, it's a big, it was a really big turning point. Um, and, uh, yeah, I chose it in that moment. I was 34 and I chose in that moment to, well, I could die or mm. given I've got another good 50 years on this planet, wow. why don't I do it how I want to do it? So that's when I decided to give my money away. That's when I decided to let go of all the rules and, and, and live in, I use the word kamikaze. I live in a kamikaze way. I live in the free way, as free as I can. I get caught up all the time, but it's a dance, you know. But I'll, I'll live like I mean it. So, no, I'm not scared of death because I feel I've lived as fully as I can in the, in the years I've, I've had. Interesting. Before. Aging? Do you worry about aging? I don't like it as a woman. Um, no, me too. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't like it. I find it interesting. I've aged. We just have little spurts, don't we? The last six months, mm. I've suddenly, God, I've suddenly aged, you know. Um, but I certainly don't fight it. I will never get Botox or anything like that. It's just not my thing. Um, I prefer to face the truth. <laughs> Are you up for a few quick fire questions? Yes, I have no idea what you're about to ask me, so we'll see if uh, what comes I out. Know, it's, it's so unfair. They're pretty, I don't know whether they're simple or not. I was going to ask you a few quick fire, 10 of them. Pool or ocean? Ocean. Mm. Eating in or eating out? Oh, I love eating out. I, I mean, I love eating full stop, but eating out, I do love. Dancing alone or together? Alone. I'm a really bad dancer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. I'd say alone for that reason alone, even yeah. though my introversion would rather I dance alone and nobody see it. What books are on your nightstand at the moment? Anything stand out to mention? Uh, yeah, I'm reading. I've got Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, which I uh -huh. dip into 
often. And I'm reading a Muriel Sparks book. I can't remember the title of it, but I do like her flirtatious writing. I like writers from that sort of post-war era. Very cool. Last time you wrote a handwritten card or letter. Oh, it would be last week, actually. I do it quite wow. often. An elderly gentleman in a nursing home wrote to me to say that he'd read my book and he'd handwritten to me, so I hand wrote back to him. Wow, that's phenomenal. That's very recent then. Weirdest, most unusual gift you've ever received. <laughs> oh, good Lord. Um, well, my family don't do this. Uh, I'm from a very large family and we're yeah. anti so we don't do gifts I would say it when we were kids we used to get a sixth of a present so I think I own a sixth of a trampoline a basketball hoop a boxing bag and a telescope somewhere in the world but they're all presents that we all share my siblings and I I was interviewing an online entrepreneur in America recently and uh, called Gloria Antanmo and she said when I asked her that question a wooden penis someone gave ah. her her wooden penis key ring and it was some kind of fertility, like she's single and they thought, you know, you should get a move on and, you know, freeze your eggs or something. So they gave her this facility, this fertility symbol. So she didn't even hesitate. She just said straight away, wooden penis. I would never seen that coming in a million years. It was hilarious. Very Wonderful. weird. You can trade places with anyone for 24 hours, past or present. Who would it be? Oh, the first thing that came to my head, I don't know if it's my right answer, is the Queen for some reason. I've just been there fascinated by what life would be like, you know. Right. Yes, let's say the Queen. Yeah, someone said to me, Oprah recently, just to know what it would be, I had to have that power for a day or two would be fantastic. Somebody said that to me from that point of view. You can be teleported anywhere in the world now. Where are you going? It would be to Africa to visit those two men. Do they live in the same area and do they know about each other? No. <laughs> okay, you've got to plan that trip then. Yeah, yeah. What always makes you laugh? Kids, my niece and nephew. Yeah, mm. yeah, 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 me too. Um, most grateful for in this past year? Well, COVID. Yeah. There you go. The fact that the exposure... The, the ripping off, off of the Band-Aid because, you know what, it's like I've been, it's just great for everybody to be seeing the same thing and to be talking about, starting to talk about or at least curious or open to or aware of some of the stuff that I've been banging on about for 30 years, you know. It feels like I, um, I feel more seen as a result because people are seeing the same things I'm seeing. And that, that sounds... Uh, I just feel like I belong more. Mm, interesting. Well, listen, I don't want to keep you um, beyond a time allowed, but I want to say a massive thank you to you, seriously, for writing books about things that I think not enough is written about that's well and, and easy to understand and feels relatable. Like you said, I feel that you're in the shoes of us all as you write, and I think that's a superpower itself in terms of a style of writing. Uh, I love Matt Haig, you know, Matt, for the same reason in the country here. Just brilliant at articulating what is often very difficult to say. Um, so thank you for that so much. You are a lovely human being. I'm so thrilled to have met you. Hope we can keep in touch, Sarah. Where can people yeah. find you that are our listeners and viewers, especially here across Europe? Oh, um, by the way, Paul, thank you for those very kind words. You made me tear up a little. Um, it's very kind to reach out like that. Um, you can find me at sarahwilson.com and um, Instagram underscore Sarah Wilson underscore. But if you just write Sarah Wilson, I'll probably pop up. Yeah. Love your Instagram and your podcasts. I love them. Thanks for them too. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, that's right. Wild with Sarah Wilson is my is my podcast yes very cool well listen sending much love to you have a great day thanks again for your time i really appreciate it hope we'll keep in touch thanks sarah courage to you all well thanks again for listening to today's podcast i hope you found it beneficial and uh, i know time is precious commodity for us all but i would love it if you would take the time to write a review or comment and above all maybe subscribe to my podcast channel thank you